Okay, so good afternoon all. I hope everyone's well, keeping well, looking after themselves. Um, today we're going to talk uh, data protection, specifically the GDPR, as everybody knows it. Uh, let me load, get my screen going. So uh, my name is Matt Riley. I'm the Quality and Compliance Director at Complete IT. Uh, I've served a little over seven years at Complete IT now um, and six years in the NHS prior to joining Complete IT. Uh, I'm also the data protection lead for Sharp in the United Kingdom. Um, many of you know Sharp and Complete IT joined forces early this year, no, end of last year. Uh, so my, my role is joined across both. Uh, the plan for this, morning, or this afternoon even is I'll go through um, the content. Uh, there is a question and answer section within Zoom. So feel free to leave any questions um, in there. And what we'll do is Jess will work through them and at the end we'll have a look and go through hopefully answer anything that comes up um, if i can't answer if i can't help what i can do is i can um, go away and have a look for you um, and if you've got any other other questions or anything else uh, feel free to send them over to jess at the end and we'll see what we can do looking into them so sort of the agenda for today is we're going to have a look go through the key terms of gdpr uh, we'll talk about central, pr central principles of data protection um, what is processing of personal data? Um, hopefully then take away a load of practical steps that you can do within your businesses. Um, we'll very briefly touch on individual rights. It is a whole subject in itself. Uh, and today what I wanted to focus on more was around really everything but individual rights um, because they can, they can be a minefield in itself. And if there is requests, we might do a smaller session on that in the future. And then again, uh, the Q&A at the end. So. Um, let's let's crank right through so um first of all general data protection regulation so the gdpr um prior to this being voted in the uh, european courts in 2016 all the different countries across europe had their own data protection regimes they're all different none of them aligned and most of them when they set were set by the eu were put in as directives so they didn't particularly have to do certain things in a certain way general data protection regulation changed that it was a regulation that all member states had to enforce um, and just some additional context on it we have also got in the uk the data protection act 2018 so gdpr covers a chunk the data protection act is then covering the rest so certain things like for example um, if you're going through a 2p process it's not mentioned there's no data protection piece mentioned within gdpr but it's enshrined in the Data Protection Act 2018. So GDPR has itself become, afford, um, become enforceable in May 2018. It had been law for a couple of years, but it really became enforceable after that. And it is concerned with the, the, citizens, uh, the data, personal data of EU citizens, so people who live within the EU, um, and it applies to all businesses within the EU. Businesses outside of the EU, if they want to do trade uh, on scale with any of the businesses within the EU, uh, they have to abide by this. So if you're a manufacturer in China and you're selling one thing over, there are certain rules, but actually most businesses will do lots of trade with the EU, so they have to make sure they comply with it. What we won't do today is do the sort of scare tactics piece of saying oh, about fines or anything like that. We're not going to touch on that. We're going to try and talk on the facts and practical steps that you can take. So yes, general data protection regulation, always fun. So personal data what is personal data so there's two parts to it really it's where you can directly identify someone from the information or where you can indirectly identify them so we'll come on to direct identification hopefully um, most of these are quite self-explanatory brief indirect identification comes from combining data so if you knew in a house uh, there were five people living and you could see that on their internet traffic at four o'clock in the afternoon there was a uh, pepper pig being streamed you could start to build a profile of the family within that house indirectly by putting together information so this actually protects both explicit uh, personal data and stuff you can imply from it but the explicit personal data uh, here are some examples so again you can identify someone by a name uh, by their location by their address uh, and the idea is by putting these things together you build up more information on that person in particular so these things are, pardon me are directly 
uh, deemed to be personal data. And the more you collect about people, the more information you have on them. So therefore, these more the more are protected. But these are particular, they're not high risk categories, um, because having the name of someone doesn't particularly tell you much about them. But there's a second set of data and it's called special category data. So this is where there is much more risk associated with the data and they fall into these categories. So for example, if um, let's use genetic data, it is really specific to me and it is really personal to me. So actually, if you think of, uh, if we were a company that processed genetic data and that data got out and it got into the hands of some insurance companies, that might put your premiums up quite a bit if that uh, genetic data wasn't particularly favorable. So these pieces of data uh, tied in with your sort of standard uh, personal data uh, really have to be, you have to have extra justification for having them and you need to make sure they are really protected because again, the impact on someone's life of this sort of data leaking out is um, quite high. Uh, there was an additional one to this that was added in a couple of months ago um, and it was uh, deemed to be ethical, ethical veganism is now a special category of data. Um, that was in law change. Um, one of the real things, interesting things I found uh, when sort of researching this was a lot of businesses and their small businesses have always collected the ethnic origin of their team members. And the question is why? Because unless you're a public sector where you have to report on uh, things like that, you don't need it. But traditionally, and always on job application forms, that's been collected. So again, if you collect it, you have to protect it, you have to look after it. The real question is, do you need it? If you don't need it, don't collect it. So those are the two sort of categories of data. You've just got personal data, and then you've got the special category data. Uh, both require different levels of protection and justifications for having it. So moving onwards, data processing. So when you have a bit of data, so new start starts with you, you'll be collecting data on them. Anything you do with that data is deemed to be data processing. So some particular examples are on here. So again, new starter joins complete IT, we've collected information on them. We'll be using that information to, uh, for example, pay them. Um, we'll be supporting them. Um, we might be sharing it with another party that sort of provides our payroll, um, but we'll be storing it as well. So actually, even if we get a bit of data and it remains in on our server, never used, we're still deemed to be processing it because we're storing it. You, as a small business, you are responsible for that information from the point of collecting it all the way around to it's being destroyed. Um, and everything that does you do with it, and everything everyone you share it with, and everything you do to it, and any way you use it is to call data processing. Now it does get a bit confusing in GDPR. You talk about data processing and data processors, and we'll come on to that in a minute. But any data that you hold as a business from that's been given to you personal data that is, is you are processing it in some form. So most organizations now, for example, have uh, Microsoft 365, Microsoft Office 365, some sort of hosted Microsoft uh, solution. Microsoft are processing that for you and on your behalf. So they're storing it on your behalf. So yeah, so although Mike's storing, uh, I had the question come up the other day actually, uh, this third party are only storing data for us, so it's, uh, it's, we don't even see it. We are still responsible for it because it's our data that we've shared with them. And I thought I'd talk you through a practical example uh, of that in, in action. So um, a couple more terms in here. So I'm going to look at, use myself as an example. I'm a data subject. I give Complete IT my permission to use my personal data in a certain way as an employee of that organisation. So I've given them, for example, my name, address, um, some personal details. When I joined, I'll have probably given them some more sensitive data as well around sickness, absence, whatever it might be. So I've said to Complete IT, you can use my data for these defined purposes. Complete IT are then known as a data controller because they now ultimately determine the purpose and processing of that data I've given them. So uh, all businesses will have 
um, systems that have HR records. Those HR records that that business controls are from that data subject. And hopefully there's some form of permission being given and some form of definition around what that data is being used for. So complete IT as the data controller in my instance are processing it on my behalf. But what they might do is we might say, actually, we don't do payroll in house and we use an outsourced payroll provider. So complete IT will go to the market and say, I need to find myself a data processor. So just as a big caveat here, this is where it does get slightly confusing. Data controller will process information. They will ask a data processor to process information for them. Now, this is really where we have to be really careful as businesses about who we work with. So the data controller is ultimately responsible for the data they have. But the data, we might then say to a payroll partner, um, I'd like you to process this data subject, personal data, for this purpose. And that would be, I'm going to give you their name and bank account details so you can pay them on our behalf. If the data processor does anything else with that data, that's not particularly legitimate. So actually the data controllers, so us as complete IT in this example, have to be really careful about who our data processors are and making sure that we and they live up to the standards we've set. Um, they don't determine what to do with that. Well, they shouldn't determine what to do with that information. A particular example I had very recently is, is we signed up um, to have a company help us out with some credit tax credits. Uh, I immediately start getting marketing information from them. And I didn't sign up for that. We didn't give approval for that. What they've done is they've taken our data and used it without our consent. So again, being very careful about it. As data controller, you are responsible for that data that you share with third parties. So one of the things we'll come on to shortly is around what is a breach. And regardless of where you are in that chain, you are the data controller. If one of your suppliers who has your data has a breach, you have a breach because you've given them permission to use that data. But we'll, we'll come on to that. So this is the, the, the processes. Off the back of data processes, it can also grow to sub-processes, uh, it does get very convoluted, but I thought as a top level, this is a really good way of hopefully saying, Matt Riley, data subject, gives my data to complete I2, who then becomes controller of it, who then employs a third party who does payroll, who has a specific purpose and a specific use for Matt Riley's data. If complete IT and that third party part ways, that data processor should get rid of all the data on Matt Riley, never use it again. So things like data processing agreements, um, and there are lots of templates online, are great for what is my data, this is what you can do with it. If you do anything else, you're breaking this agreement. So I thought I'd give you a good example, a few good examples of some data processes. So a number here. And these are, again, any organisation that you contract potentially to do some services for you. So couriers. So if you uh, ship goods out, you'll be giving them the names and addresses of the people being delivered to. If they use those names and addresses for any other purpose other than what you've set it out, they're not them. They're breaking the law effectively. Um, partners like Microsoft hosting your data, they are processing your data. They're not doing anything with it, but by merely storing it, they are processing it. There are loads. I just thought I'd put some in here. So just to get people thinking about the sort of relationships they have with third parties and how that data that you give them is processed. Because again, those processors who, you, who are processing information on your behalf and your business's behalf will can put you at risk because they are only acting in your interest. You are ultimately controlling that data. So you need to choose who you share it with. So having gone sort of through subject, data subjects, data controller and data processor, I thought I'd touch on the lawful, the lawful reasons to process data. And there are six. So we'll come to consent in a second because lots is made of consent within the general debt within GDPR. So the two contract and legal obligation, I'm hoping are quite self-explanatory. You put a contract in place, uh, like we have, for example, with the clients we support, uh, and 
we will share pub, um, we'll share personal data between the organizations to allow us to support them so we'll have the names and work addresses and work contact details for the team so we can call them and pick, bring them up so the other side of that was we'll share our team members data under that contract so your teams can contact us legal obligation is then where for example you have to share information with hmrc um, when it's demanded of things uh, retaining data around um, pensions for example so there's quite clear legal obligations within law to say why you might have to process certain data and then the bottom three are the more uh, sort of the, they don't typically come up in the SME market though we work with a lot of businesses so vital interest uh, it would be pretty terrible if you went to A&E and unfortunately they couldn't help you because they weren't allowed to access your um, online records so that's covered under vital interest um, public interest is then around where a public body is tasked with doing a particular task and that means they need to process your data use your local council social services etc uh, and final one is legitimate interest and this one is used a lot by small businesses although it's it, it's uh, not the best ground to to work on um, complete it for example have chosen not to use legitimate interest many of you will have known we were we've been bought last year by sharp business systems in theory we could have said legitimate interest sharp business systems and complete it have a legitimate interest to do a big load of direct mass marketing to the complete it client base and vice versa for this cross services well we don't think there's although there is a legitimate interest we don't think that's a good enough reason to process the information in that way so it's why we won't have seen us directly emailing uh, on mass uh, would you like managed print so you have to be very careful about using legitimate interest um, there is quite a lot around it and if you do want some more information on do you think my right my, my processing could be covered under legitimate interest if it's not covered under the other five there is an assessment tool to found you can find on the ico's website um, and it'll ask a few questions um, about why you might be processing that data to see if you would be covered under legitimate interest um, most small businesses will use it it isn't um i wouldn't say it's ex specifically that great as a legal justification and if there was an ever uh, if you did ever have a breach and you had lots of information that was you held under legitimate interest it's it's a bit shaky grounds to be fair much better to get explicit consent or be covered under one of the other for, uh, one of the four options so we'll, we will touch on consent more because actually there is a lot made of consent within the general data protection relation yeah gdpr let's go with that one so it must be explicit um, a bit further down silence isn't consent someone needs to say yes i consent it has to be freely given and it can't be compulsory it has to be an understandable and clear language that people can understand and you can't sort of mish mash consents together um, so you have to be really specific around that consent actually at any one point you have the right to remove consent so you will all have the emails that come to the bottom and say unsubscribe here that's written into law that you are have the right to once your consent's been given to take it back and lots has changed with gdpr in the last since it's been well, it's nearly two years now uh, but one of the real clear bits of change there was a legal case last year uh, called the planet 49 ruling and it touched on consent in cookies so here's hopefully the first bit of practical advice have a look at your cookies on your website so most small businesses have websites this is an example of where those rules of consent weren't being followed and the planet 49 rule uh, changed things so you couldn't on your website you always used to say click to accept policy uh, click to accept cookies that's no long no longer compliant with gdpr this is an example um, of a proper cookie consent form so the each individual has uh, each individual can select which cookies they are happy to take individually if they want so if they didn't want to do marketing that's fine they can do statistics and preferences only there are necessary cookies to allow websites to work but fundamentally you've given the person explicit consent you've not mashed it into one all the different types of cookies and you can opt out 
but this is the first example. So there are lots of organizations out there that will help you with your cookie framework. Uh, and you do need to state on your websites in a cookie policy what each of those are in the show details section. Uh, even down to things like Google Analytics, what they're used for, how they're used. But there are third parties out there that can help you with that. And um, we can put you in contact with some details of companies that we've used or we've had experience with. Um, but that's the first real, one of the first major changes, um, legal challenges to the GDPR and things that changed off the back of it. So lots of even large businesses will not be ahead of this game and you still go on their websites and it still says just accept all. That isn't compliant any longer. So once you hopefully have got consent, what you need to have or some reason to be um, some reason to be having that processing that data, there are six principles relating to the processing of personal data. There is a seventh, um, it's called accountability. It's not in GDPR, but it's accepted to be part of GDPR. And hopefully most of what we've touched on so far, you can hopefully see in this. So we're processing it lawfully because we've got consent. We've been open and transparent about why we're consenting, why, why we're using this information and what we're using it for. So again, another one of the learn, one of the uh, big lessons, hopefully to take away, is if you're asking people to fill in online forms, before they submit it to you, you should be showing them what you're going to do with it. So you can't take the information and go, by the way, we're going to do this with it. Being transparent, you're giving us your name and telephone number, and we are going to call you and ask for feedback. So you, you're being very transparent with it. It has a defined purpose. So again, I, I gave my uh, this tax credits company, I gave them my email address, and the purpose in my mind was to help me with tax credits. What they actually did was market to me. So I, I wasn't good enough about checking that, that defined purpose in advance. What you should also do is minimize the data you collect. So again, using the example of ethnic origin, most businesses will never ever use that. So why collect it? You don't need it, don't collect it. If you have a legitimate reason to claim it, uh, sorry, collect it, such as a legal obligation, absolutely fine. But most businesses don't. You also have to be responsible for keeping that data up to date. If you've got it, you control it, you should be up to date. And that again, touches on individual rights. One of the individual rights is the uh, right to accuracy. So you should always give the options when collecting data about letting people know how they can keep it up to date. Uh, and the, nearly there, um, it should be kept for a defined period. So again, something, if you bought some marketing with, uh, lists years and years ago, A, it's probably not up to date anymore, but you need to be cleansing that data. You shouldn't hold data for more than you ever need to. Again, things like HR records, we, for example, we will redact HR records over time and they'll go after seven years, the exception of any legal obligations that we need to keep data for any longer, which for us, there isn't, as far as I'm aware. But most importantly, it's processed in a manner, manner which ensures integri integrity and confidentiality. And a lot of this then is around things, technical, solu technical solutions you put in place to make sure no one can change it without permission or no one can access it when they shouldn't. And that sort of comes on to the next part of this, which is breaches of the GDPR. Uh, Apologise, it's an incredibly wordy sentence and I'm not going to try and read it out because I will mess up my words. But a personal data breach is effectively the change of data, destructive data, loss of data, unauthorised disclosure, unauthorised disclosure of or access to personal data while it's stored, transmitted or any other way it's processed. Sorry, mouthful. I thought I'd get the technical term in there. But effectively, that data you control, if there's anything unauthorised happens to it, then it's deemed to be a breach. Now, breach isn't a scary term. Uh, there is the whole perception about fines and all that. Actually, the biggest piece here is not all breaches even need to be reported to the ICO. Um, we as Complete IT and SBS haven't had one yet that we've needed to report to the ICO. Some of our, uh, one of our suppliers had to report it to the ICO when they had a breach that contained our data, but the, the the impact, the likelihood and severity of the resulting risk to our team's rights and freedoms was very low because actually all it was was a name and a, and a work contact detail. If, for example, was touched on my example earlier on, you had genetic data on people and that got stolen, 
the risk to that person's rights and freedoms is much higher. Therefore, reporting it to the ICO is, is a sensible choice. So again, there are, on the ICO's website, there are tools on there to help you with assessing the likelihood and severity of the resulting risk. But what I thought I'd do is I'll take you through a bit of a process around that breach procedure. So you've got a good bit of an overview for it. So data controller identifies a data breach. That might be one they've discovered of themselves, or it might be one of their data processes have come to them and said, we've had a breach, some of your data is affected. Now this is where breaches shouldn't be scary because of the fact that they will happen all the time. There will be no industry out there that can say, me as data controllers, my suppliers and my customers are all so squeaky clean, they've never had a breach. An example, we had one of our Sharp customers, um, we provide managed print services for, they had a massive ransomware attack that took them offline for quite a bit of time. We had our team, they had, sorry, our team members' data. Technically, we've shared that data with them as data controllers, therefore we've had a breach. But again, as we'll come on to in a sec, we didn't actually need to report it to the ICO for these very reasons. So we've identified we've had a breach, be that us as a business or one of our processes we shared information with, or customers to be fair. So the first thing we'll assess is, is the risk likely to result in, in, a big, or in a risk to that individual's rights and freedoms? So again, low risk data, your name, your work address. So yes, you could identify someone, but if someone got a load of list of people's work addresses, it's not particularly that high risk. Again, assessment tools to help you with what is a high risk and what isn't. So is it likely to result in a risk? If the answer is yes, you need to report it to the ICO within 20, uh, sorry, within 72 hours of that breach being identified. If you don't believe it's a risk, you should record it yourself in your own register. And one of the things is you learn from it. Uh, next, uh, so you've reported it to the ICO. Now, do you think there's a really high risk to the individual, to their rights and freedoms? If the answer is yes, you need to let them know. If the answer is no, you don't need to let them know. But again, make your own record of it. So if something happens in the future, you can reference it back. A lot of this is around recording your activity and your decisions about why you might choose to do or do choose pardon me, to do or not do something. Uh, another example recently was a provider of Wi-Fi services to train stations had a massive data breach, but they sort of said to themselves, well, the risk of the individual is very low. It's, they could justify it afterwards, but actually you sort of sit there and go, it affected so many people that they probably should have done more, but that's in the courts and that'll come out over time. So I thought again through some practical practical examples of breaches um, that we all will ha happen to all of us every day. So again, someone leaves a laptop on a train. If it is a laptop that's got lots of personally identifiable information on it and it is um, not encrypted, not password protected, high risk. If it's fully encrypted, fully password protected, the risk is incredibly low at that point. So again, each situation is different. And you have to make that assessment of what data's on there and what risk does it pose. Ransomware is a bit of an all-rounder because it does, you don't know if someone's taking copies of that encrypted data. You don't know if they're changing it while it's encrypted, but also the fact it's not available. So personal data needs to be available. It's not available to whoever would want to use it. Again, technically that's a breach. Um, but these are some of the, the sort of standard standards. These are the things you see. Um, people are unaccessed. people accessing folders on the, your company's servers that they shouldn't have access to again is deemed to be a breach so these are some hopefully some practical examples to get you thinking but there's a mixture here of technical examples but also people examples and unfortunately we are all the weakest links so the, there was a the ICO do a quarterly report on breaches and these are the top five so everything um, some of the categories are a bit vague, to be fair, but these are the top five breach categories for the last quarter of last year. Um, and really, the top four, I'd probably say, are all people related. So, phishing, 
Phishing is a technical problem, but it's the person that falls for it. Um, and examples of this would be, again, uh, putting your, taking a phishing email, putting your, uh, thinking it's um, Microsoft's homepage, logging in, they've then got your username and password. And they can then use that to log into your Office 365 account. Um, big one, it happens more than everybody would ever think. Data email to the incorrect recipient. You try and send it to Robert and it goes to Robert at different surname. So things like these are, these are the things you need to look out for most. There are lots of categories and some are very vague, but these are the ones that really were on there. And again, if you want to have a look, the ICO's website uh, is brilliant for publishing information. So that's sort of moving into the final section, practical steps that you can take as a business to help with your general data protection preparation, etc. So training is by far the most important thing you can do. The categories on the previous page are all mostly down to people making mistakes. And we're all human, we make mistakes, but it is the cause of a lot of this. So your team need to know what a breach is and how your internal reporting works. Um, we have, for example, me, my role um, across both businesses. Um, people come to me with questions, people come to me with concerns, um, and we have a reporting structure internally we've built. Um, they need to understand these principles so they can abide by it. Um, I get people come to me daily and say, I've seen this, is this okay? Or I've seen that, and is that okay? So I'd rather a million questions come to me, to be fair, um, but it shows that people have got a, an understanding and a good, a growing understanding of what the principles are. Again, touched on it, people are the weakest link. People fall for phishing emails, unfortunately, all the time. Um, and it is a simple mistake. I didn't look at the web address. Uh, I thought it was legitimate. I genuinely thought I got that from HMRC, all that sort of stuff. But there are online training platforms that can provide a lot of this basic training. Uh, there are some specific privacy related ones. And there are like, for example, the complete training platform that will eventually have snippets of uh, data protection pieces in it as well. So training your team is the number one piece. Secondly, it's about knowing your data. And this is really important for the remote working piece because data now is everywhere. Uh, it used to be, be on your server, in one place, you controlled it. Well, now with people working remotely, how people connect into it will be very different. Some will be using Office 365, some will be VPNing in, some will be using remote desktop. Understanding what data you have, where you have it, why you have it, what it's used for, and that legal justification for keeping it is really, really important. There'd be nothing worse than you have a massive data breach and you have to turn around and go, I don't know what data I had. And that has happened uh, with one of our sharp customers where they had no idea what data they had. They couldn't tell what had been stolen or not. Um, uh, the best way of doing this is create yourself a record of data processing. And again, there's some templates on the ICO website, but a quick Google. It, would, it effectively takes all the, it takes, it's a record for you of everything that I've just mentioned above. Um, and it, when you have to report anything, it should hopefully give you all your answers that you never need. You need to prepare for an inevitable breach. And I say inevitable. You might have all the security in the world. You might have all the training in the world. Someone might still click a link. Again, your suppliers, if they have a breach, you, they have your company's data, your company's people, data, personal data. Technically, it's a breach. Again, you don't have to necessarily declare it to the ICO, but you should at least have it investigated and understand the risk to you from their breach. So you need, they, you need to know how to recognize it. You need to have a plan for addressing it and have an individual who, or team who is, who is effectively given the responsibility to manage breaches in the reporting. Uh, just on that note, not all businesses need a data protection officer. That's really for DPO, data protection officer. Um, it's really, if you're a public authority, you need one, um, or you process a lot of sensitive uh, special category data, or you process humongous amounts of general data. Those are the organizations that need data protection officers. Um, so most of the SMEs that we support and we work with, we don't. What it is, is just have someone internally that is a bit clued up around data protection and has knowledge of data protection and what to do in the event of a breach. And have an escalation framework so your team know what to do. So one of the team on the production floor knows if they see a breach or see an incident, they know what to do about it.
And the final operational one is have a plan to respond. So again, risk, understand the risk of the individual, have a plan and how you will notify the ICO. Um, know what you need to give them. So by knowing the data you hold, you potentially know what's been compromised. Uh, and if required, have a process for informing the infected individuals. And finally, the most important bit is document, document your breaches so you can learn from them, even if you don't have to report them, because that way you are, can show over time, if you did have a big breach that did need to report it, you can show we learned from these lessons and we applied them. This At this point, we still were breached. Again, it, it all looks very positive and it's a real positive outlook on making sure you are being really proactive around the management of your data protection and the risks associated with it. And then there are some additional technical steps you can put in place. Um, everyone who has Office 365, um, multi uh, MFA, two-factor authentication, multi-factor authentication, as various names, um, should have it implemented. Um, I know it's unpopular in a lot of cases, but it, it is quite important. Um, someone falls through a phishing email, they put their Office 365 login details into a website. At that point, without multi-factor authentication, they can access your Office 365 login without a problem because they've got your login details. Multi-factor authentication can stop that because it requires that person to have that second form of identification. Um, I thought I'd define this one, keep your data within your management. So traditionally it was on your servers, so it was kept within your firewall, which is your gatekeeper. Um, but more recently, things like SharePoint, you control SharePoint, you control who has access to what, you manage it. So it's within your management. One of the challenges with VPNs is the information was on your server, you've pulled it to your laptop you're working on. Well, it's not protected by your network anymore and you will send it back hopefully. But if that laptop died while that person was using it, that data's gone or was stolen while it was open, the data's gone. So the more you can keep within your control, the better. Um, and for all those companies, at the, especially at the moment, where you're letting your team use their own devices at home to connect in via VPN, via uh, SharePoint, whatever it would be, offer to cover them with antivirus and anti-malware. Because then we've had examples in the past where, again, using Office 365 passwords, someone's gone home and worked from home. Well, their home PC had a keylogger on it. So that keylogger picked up their usernames and passwords. If they'd have been in the office, it wouldn't have fallen victim because the antivirus would have picked it up. But for those home working, not having antivirus or anti-malware meant that keylogger wasn't picked up, so they got the username and password that way. In that instance, uh, the company in question had multi-factor authentication. So although that company had their username and password, they still couldn't get into their account. And that was really important. So there's an extra layer, but some technical steps. The next piece is about putting really good access controls in place. So where you do use passwords, yes, if you accidentally put them into a website, it sort of becomes irrelevant. But make sure your passwords are collect, uh, complex. You change them frequently, and most importantly, you don't share them. If you don't know who has access to a device, who has access to what information because you share passwords, that's a real big no-no, and that's sort of very much frowned upon. But within your systems, limit who can see what. You've got your HR file. Only certain people should have that. You've got your uh, customer files on your customer groups that has personal information in it. Well, only give it to the people that need to see it. If you have pass, if you have spreadsheets or documents that you send around with personal data in it, even if you're just using them internally, put a password on them because that will stop other people accessing them, sometimes accidentally, sometimes maliciously. But again, if you accidentally send them externally to someone else, uh, at least they might not be able to access them without the password. Um, and again, if you're sending them a password, send it a different way. Send it via text or something that will call them and give them the password. So again, you're putting human two-factor authentication in there. And finally, if you store databases and store your data in databases, put controls in place so can't, people can't download from them. There'd be nothing worse than having a customer database that you then someone can download the entire customer list from and send it to their personal email address before they leave. Um, so having controls around in who can access what and who can download what is really important. So those are two technical steps and there were some good operational steps in there as well. Um, so yeah, the, the final bits are just touching on the individual rights. And this is a, 
its own subject in itself. And there are two most people will be aware of. You've got the right to erasure, which is the right to be forgotten. And there's right to access, which is the right, uh, it's, it's, people know it as a subject access request. Um, if you get a subject access request, for example, there's lots of processes you need to follow um, and you have to respond to that individual, but within one month. But again, as I touched on, this is a subject into itself and I'm happy in the future if there is demand to do a piece on individual rights. I know there was a bit of a whistle stop tour. Um, there's lots to cover. GDPR is quite a big beast. It's quite complicated, but actually there are some real simple things that you can do to protect yourself, protect your data and ultimately protect your business. Um, so I hope that was useful for some people. Uh, and I hope well, there's some questions come through which we can um, Jess can go through now, hopefully. So, Jess. Yeah, we haven't actually got any questions yet, which is because you did such a good job, I would imagine. Um, but if anyone does have any questions, if you want to send them through now using the Q&A and the um, chat, if you want to, give it a few minutes. Yep. There's one here. So if I had a database of historic contacts that I used to market to, what do I need to do with those if I haven't got explicit consent? Yeah, so it, it's a difficult one because you could probably say under legitimate interest, they bought from me in the past and um, I think they might be interested in my services again. But if that was three years ago, might they really be that interested? Why haven't they contacted you in the three years? So what you need to do as an organization is agree on how long you want, how long you believe you can keep that data for under legitimate interest or with explicit consent that they might have said that you can keep it for two years. Um, we, for example, with our new business data, so for when we're looking at hopefully winning new organizations to work with, we keep that for a year. After a year, if we've had no interaction with that individual or that organization at all we get rid of it because we don't think at that point consent would be valid because it's a long time ago and again we don't really use legitimate interest as a business because it's a bit shaky so yeah then it's just documenting that you are cleansing that data if you're going to delete data document that you've deleted it not to say uh, i've deleted bob at clive limited but we've cleansed our database uh, which had ten thousand records in it great thank you um, under SharePoint, how do you rest restrict access to particular folders? Yeah, that, that's all done through permissions. Um, your technical consultant um, will be much better placed to ever answer that question. But again, you can build within the folder structures permissions like you do with on your servers. So it's only certain people will ac have access to certain folders. Um, so actually, again, if you want to restrict permissions, your technical consultant and the help desk can help with that one. Again, I think just be always careful when you're implementing new um uh implementing new permissions that you're not going to break in i think um, lots of people lots of businesses have spreadsheets that are spread out again if you put permissions in pray you will break them uh it is good to be over cautious and then have a way of giving it's best to be over cautious and then allowing people access uh as opposed to um like having an open book style thing okay um, we've been told under safeguarding, we have told names and event dates involving anyone in a leadership role dealing with children for at least 70 years. That's a long time. Okay, so again, that would probably then come under legal obligation. So most businesses won't have the legal obligation to keep that data for that long. Um, hospitals, for example, when I was there, they had to keep hospital records for I think it was 15 years before it went into long-term archive storage so each will be different if you have a legal obligation to keep that data one of the sections in the record of data processing is how long no, is retention plan so how long will you retain that data for um, so again just documenting what data is covered under legal obligation therefore saying why you've got it and how long are you going to keep it for that's the record you need because then if you had that breach you've got a legal reason to have kept that data. Right, thank you. Um, if someone asks to erase their data, can we, are we able to keep 
as long as legally we should keep as a company and inform them yeah so again this is where the, the individual rights stuff gets does get complicated because the, if you've got data you're holding under legal obligation you can't delete it so you can remove everything else around it with the exception of that legal obligation so if we had to if we had a right to be forgotten request at complete it uh, i think our legal obligation around some of the payroll stuff is and uh, hmrc is seven years the individual has the right to say delete everything we can go back and say we've deleted it all but we have to keep this this data for this legal reason um and we're not allowed to delete it so what when it comes to the individual rights piece it's about really being specific with the questions you answer back so subject access requests are a great example if someone says i want all the data you have have ever had on me you can ask the question okay you're looking for anything in particular that you want to see because everything else on mass is then a very time consuming enterprise but it is something you have to do Perfect, thank you. And I don't think we've got, well, we've not got any more questions in now. So if no one else has got any questions, thank you very much, Matt. No, thank you very much. And I hope everyone found that informative. Brilliant, thank you. Lovely, take care all.